Welcome to Amazing Business Radio with best-selling author and customer service and business expert, Shep Hyken. Shep will talk with some of the smartest thinkers in business to help make you more successful in your professional and personal life. This is Amazing Business Radio with Shep Hyken. Hello, everybody. It's Shep Hyken here. We're back with another episode of Amazing Business Radio. We have a great guest today. It is Dr. Seth Dobrin, IBM's first global chief AI officer. And this is very exciting. I love talking about artificial intelligence and how it's impacting us as consumers. And we're going to be talking about that and much more. Before we get into the interview, a couple of quick announcements. And you know what they are if you've heard the show before. If you've got a great story or question, please reach out to me on any social media channel, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and more. And if it is a question, use the hashtag AskShep. I'll answer the question you send in either in that medium in this show, in my newsletter, and maybe even my TV show, which is Be Amazing or Go Home. That can be found on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon Prime. And you can actually go to beamazing.tv. That's beamazing.tv. And you can catch episodes there. All right, let's jump into the interview. Well, Seth, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. Well, I'm excited because uh, as I saw that we're going to be talking about AI, which uh, artificial intelligence and business, and a lot of people have this vision of a movie that Will Smith was in where AI was taking over the world. Uh, But I think we're we're a long way from that happening. But I think this is just a fascinating topic. Um, Real quick, before I ask you my first question, I, I know you're with IBM. I have had the wonderful opportunity to attend a number of IBM Watson, World of Watson conferences, and they were huge in Las Vegas. And by the way, so much fun, the education as well as the entertainment, everything from Elton John to, um, gosh, uh, I think, who's the last one I saw? Maybe Sheryl Crow or somebody great. But you've had some wonderful people, Maroon 5. Anyway, that's not why you go to a conference. You go to a conference to learn. That's why we're doing this today. Uh, So let's start off. Human-centered AI. Let's talk about what that is, what it means, and let's kind of tee it up for what we're going to do as far as the customer service and experience is concerned? Yeah, so so that's a, a really good question. You know, over the, before I joined IBM, I led a Fortune 500 company uh, through a digital transformation, leveraging, you know, data and AI, essentially. And, and what I discovered at that, you know, kind of serendipitously and somewhat purposely was that you need to focus on outcomes and you need to focus on the human's that are involved could be Im- impacted by the AI uh, and using the AI, which may or may not be the same person. And over the course of the last five years at IBM, I've realized that you know many of our customers and, and many people in the world don't realize that when you build AI, it's you know they know it's to solve a problem, but they don't often don't think of the humans that are involved until the end. Uh, and starting out the conversation with Again, who's going to be using the AI? Why are they going to be using it? And what are they going to be using it in the first place? And recognizing that the end user of the AI, the business user, and the person impacted by that AI may or may not be the same person. Uh, and, and so, you know, the goal, the ultimate goal of AI is not to have a cool project. It's to drive business value. And usually companies drive business value through customers. Uh, and, you know, in today's world and, and even previously, when you think about implementing AI, there's some, some challenges, right? We often hear of the bad stories, right? Beyond Will Smith, we often hear of things gone awry where, we'll, where, where AI is not fair or it's not explainable. Uh, it's biased against certain groups. And so in order to understand what biases you need to control for and what type of explainability you need, you have to understand the human up front. And so for value reasons, for social justice reasons, for just doing the right thing and regulatory reasons, you need to consider the humans and most companies don't approach their AI projects from that perspective. Wow, you know, I'm fascinated by the whole bias thing, whether it be race, culture, gender, whatever, and how AI is hopefully going to um, equalize everybody in that return based on what AI knows about this customer, not who, what group or part of a world the customer is. I don't know if I'm saying that the right way, but, but I think that gets rid of the bias. I'd like to jump into how uh, AI, because this whole thing is about customer service and customer experience. That's what the show's about. 
How does it, uh, what's the increased role of AI in customer care? Yeah, I just wanted to jump back and, and make a comment on what you what you said uh, mm -hmm. about trust, because that's, that's, in fairness, that's really important. Oh, so, trust is huge. I didn't say something about yeah. trust, but let's go with trust, yeah. because you and, have to you have to trust the company you're doing business with. Yeah, but but the, the fairness component, right? So, I mean, there's two types of, of fairness when, or bias when we think about controlling bias. One is local, which you described, which is at the individual level, and there's global, which is at the group level, and they impact each other. Um, and, and so it's important to understand those two types because we need to consider both. And AI, actually, if we do it right and we address bias and fairness in an appropriate manner, it actually has the opportunity to make AI and the world a better and fairer place because we can eliminate or reduce the human tendency to have biases when we're driving decisions. And so I just want to make, make that comment because it's a really important piece that you, you hit on there. Yeah, I um, think very important, especially more important, it seems, today than ever before. Yeah. Yep. Um, All right. So back to the original question, the increasing role of AI and customer care. Uh, tell us a little bit about what's going on there. Yeah. So, you know, even for the, for before the pandemic, we saw a huge rise in the, in the level of AI being leveraged for customer care, for virtual agents or chatbots, if you will. During the pandemic, for multiple reasons, we saw a huge acceleration. Um, you know, first and foremost was we saw an acceleration in you know organizations, companies, governments, you know, healthcare entities, things like that, who were uh, you know interacting with the public because the public had a lot of questions, um, and you know some of the questions were uh, you know very easy to answer, like you know what are the COVID incidents or you know are my schools open. Right, that's that's uh, pretty easy to, to address and say, yeah, it's open or yeah, it's not. But there were hours and hours of wait times, right? In some parts of the U.S. and some parts of the world, there were like eight, 10, 12 hours of wait time to talk to a human. So companies like CVS Health, we worked with them on a building a virtual agent to handle this their 10x increase in call volume, so they could essentially deflect conversations that didn't need to speak with a human, right? What are COVID incidents in my area? You know, what are the restrictions? Do our schools open? Can I get a vaccine? If I'm eligible for a vaccine, we get a little more complicated. Can I schedule my vaccine? And where's the best place to go? Um, and so, you know, this type of technology leveraging AI was able to deflect like 90% of the conversation. So those 10% where you really, really needed to speak to a human to get an answer, you could. Um, and now. Underlying this is a lot of technology, uh, and the technology is focused on language. And we like to think of AI in terms of you know we we help companies understand the language of their business, which includes technical jargon. It includes extracting insights from vast volumes of text. For instance, you know if I have you know, reams and reams of literature, can I extract what is essentially an FAQ? And what for the COVID case with CV, CVS, what this amounted to is, can I extract what the incident is in an automated fashion from a document that the CDC puts out or a county health department puts out so that I can provide my customers, in this case, you know, CVS or Kroger did the same thing, the most up-to-date, most accurate information for their local area possible. So the question I have is, how do you get your customers to use a technology that incorporates AI versus waiting on the phone for, I know I didn't have to wait eight hours, but I know that there were two incidents right at the beginning of COVID. I won't tell you the name of the company and even what they do, but I waited for hours only to be disconnected because their day ended. Oh, that drove me oh, crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so I think that's a, that's, that's a really important question, right? It gets back to the conversation about human-centered AI. It's, it's, you need to generate value and we generate value through the humans we interact with. Now, you know, when we think about implementing AI in customer care, specifically virtual agents, and virtual agents are different than chatbot because virtual agents are AI, chatbots just, you know, dumb rules-based interactions. All right. um, so let, and let's so make sure we, we understand the term because many people think that the virtual agent is the agent that doesn't work in a support center, but works virtually oh. from home. Okay, right. so the virtual agent 
you say is not AI or is a no, it, it, it is AI. It's not, a, it's different than a chatbot. A chatbot is stupid, right? A, a virtual agent is intelligent. Okay. Um, and, so and basically, has, it, it's, it's a difference of we've trained the chatbot to answer certain questions, but the agent has taken that to a whole nother level. And there's a, a sense of intuitiveness on the part of the computer that's driving the answer. Yeah, and they can, they, they, and it can, you know, the, the virtual agent can actually derive answers for things it wasn't directly trained for, right? So, so for instance, you know, I may, you know, a, a virtual agent may have been trained on a topic such as, uh, you know, uh, medications, but they may not be able to give detailed definitions of the medications. But they can go to a document and they can extract that. Right. There's no reason to train that up front. It just needs to know where to go. And it's got an AI that knows how to extract information from documents or text or web pages and can surface it. So, so, so that's the, kind the, of the difference. The, uh, the computer, it, it, I mean, we're calling the virtual agent is basically a computer that is really, really smart, knows not only how to answer some questions, but knows how to get the questions that uh, haven't been asked yet, or maybe uh, doesn't hasn't been trained to answer, knows where to go to get information. No different. I always think that, you know, AI, this type of technology that we're talking about now is made to be used by humans and it's made by humans. Therefore, it's we're really doing the same thing. We're just finding a different way to communicate the information. L let me ask yeah. you a question. Uh, I guess the way I, I, I I'm blown away by all of this. Uh, really, in in the most positive way. I I mean, I'm the guy that says, put a chip in my neck, and if you make my life better, you know, feed me the information I need, need to know. Uh, but where where I see, you know, the big issues, like I call the company and I'm on their website, and this is a chat bot. I'm interested, yeah. and and by the way, our listeners may have heard this example before. I'm on the I'm on the website. I'm on the site of a docking station. The box that I plug my computer into my my lap or my portable computer the one i travel with and i hook it into bigger screens and my full size keyboard and i said uh, it doesn't seem it didn't tell me does this docking station charge my computer or do i still need a second cord to do that that was my question and the answer was which computer are you interested in purchasing so i'm not interested in i type back i'm not interested in purchasing a computer I'm interested in the docking station. Does it also charge the computer? Came back. Which computer are you interested in? <laughs> so we know we're dealing right. with a dumb chatbot. Okay, that yeah. didn't understand the question. Uh, but you're saying the technology now is able to put two and two together. By the way, that was the other yeah. thing when when IBM Watson beat uh, Jeopardy, won Jeopardy. Did you? Are you familiar with that experiment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, it's basically it's thinking about the answer, not just knowing the answer. Yeah, and, and, and you know, more, you know, that was, that was quite a feedback in the day. We recently at a think conference, which was kind of the follow on conferences or the new World of Watson conference, we had Project Debater, which took it an even step further and actually had a debate with the human. But that's, that's related, but it's a different topic. We, we started this conversation around adoption, right? How do we get customers yeah. to use it? Do we ever which, answer that all, question? All of, these, all of these things, all of these things we've been, we've, we've been talking about. I'm saying I'm getting you, I'm getting the interview back on topic for you. Thank um, you. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's, it's a really important question. These things we kind of, the tangent we went on are very related. Um, but we, we need to make sure that the AI is actually solving a problem for the end user. In this case, the person being impacted. You or I, when we're calling, say, you know, uh, uh, Quicken Loans. So Quicken Loans is a mortgage company in the US, Rocket Mortgage. They use our technology and an interaction with Rocket Mortgage for me, because I'm a customer as well, through their virtual agent, I want, actually want to use the virtual agent, don't want to talk to the human because it's so good. Right, I can initiate a process that is usually incredibly painful, a mortgage, and I can get what usually takes days or weeks done in less than an hour through a virtual agent. I can get them all the documents, I can initiate the mortgage, I can tell them what house, who my realtor is, what I want, you know, all of those things, you know, that usually take days at least in a good process with the, with the person. I can take it all the way to the underwriting process without ever speaking with a human if that's what I want. 
And they've made the process so good that I don't want to speak to a human until I get to the underwriting process. And isn't so that the way it should be? I mean, that is, that is the way it should be. It, should, it shouldn't be that I get on the phone and I've had some where this, I get on the phone and after like a minute, I'm like, agent, agent, pushing zero because it's so bad mm. because they're not solving my problem, right? They're solving a problem that they think or that, that they think I have that isn't really a problem I have. And it's in a way that is completely useless to me and frustrating, like your example with the docking station. Right. Right. So, and so it's voice interaction that we're talking about, too. It, it's it, not it, you're not typing. You're actually interacting with voice. You, you can do it either way. So you can do. And, and that's another point. Right. Today's world is omnichannel. I want to be able to do voice. I want to be able to do type, you know, textual interaction. I want to be able to talk to a human and it should be consistent. Right. A great, consistent experience. Is, let's say you were on the docking station company's website and you happen to be logged into your account. When you hit that virtual agent, the virtual agent or the chat bot in this case should have said, hey, I see you're on this. You know, do you have a question about this docking station? I see you bought one. Yep. Right. It, it, should, it should have, have been prompting you. Yep. It should have been prompting you. Right. And then if it couldn't answer the question, it should say, let me connect you with an agent. And that agent shouldn't start with, have you restarted the docking station? They should say, you know, they should have the conversation from the textual or, or you know, or, or transcription of the voice interaction that you had with a virtual agent. And it should be able to start over and start at a place that's meaningful for you instead of starting over. Because that's incredibly frustrating for me, too. I just spent all this time with this virtual agent on the website and I get to a real human because you couldn't solve my problem, say, with my computer. And the first thing they do is, can you restart the computer? No, I've done that already three times. I don't want to. <laughs> That makes sense. Hey, let's take a short break. We come back. I want to share with you the scenario that was uh, talked about from the main stage at the last IBM Think conference I went to, which was about a year prior to COVID starting. We'll be right back. This is Amazing Business Radio. We're talking with Dr. Seth Dobrin, IBM's first global chief AI officer. We'll be right back. Don't go away. Hi, Shep Hyken, your customer service and experience expert. And I'm excited to tell you about my new book, I'll Be Back, How to Get Customers to Come Back Again and Again. Now, this book is packed with idea after idea on how to, just as the title implies, get your customers to come back. In the book, you'll learn that repeat customers aren't always loyal customers. Now, both are great, but there's a big difference. you also learn about 10 reasons a customer may stop doing business with you and three reasons you would stop doing business with them. And one of my favorite lessons is a six-step process for creating an I'll Be Back strategy. Of course, there's much, much more. You'll start getting more of your customers to say, I'll be back almost immediately. Just go to www.I'llBeBackBook.com. Com. Again, that's www.I'llBeBackBook.com. You're listening to Amazing Business Radio with best-selling author and customer service and business expert, Shep Hyken. We're back on Amazing Business Radio talking with Dr. Seth Dobrin, IBM's first global chief AI officer. I'm going to share with you two scenarios. I think they're really, really cool. It's like, to me, we're in the future, but the future is happening right now. So this happened uh, at an IBM Think conference. One of the customers came on stage at one of the general sessions, which I think there were maybe 20,000 people attending that general session. It was wonderful. And this is the story he shared. He apparently had something to do with a major uh, retail department store chain. And he said, we're experimenting with facial recognition cameras. When the customer walks into the doors, the camera recognizes the customer. And as soon as the customer starts to interact with a salesperson, regardless of what department they're in, this uh, the AI kicks in and starts telling in an earpiece the salesperson who the customer is, what they bought before, and what they might be interested in buying based on not only the information about this customer, but matching that customer up with perhaps thousands of other customers that are just like this customer. By the way, same thing in the customer support world calling customer support, the customer, as soon as they're, they're discovered who they are, and that could be through voice authentication or just a couple of quick questions to know who the customer is, the AI kicks in and tells the agent who the customer is. And whatever the question that customer has, it helps the agent find the answer. But on top of that, matches that customer up with, again, thousands of other customers 
but have had the same questions about the same product, thereby giving the agent the ability to answer questions a customer doesn't even know they are going to ask. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that, that is that is crazy. And and those two are, are really good examples for a reason that maybe you didn't anticipate. So the second one is a is 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 an interaction that leverages AI that I that a human has essentially opted into. So they're agreeing to let the company use biometric information, in this case their voice print, to authenticate them. At some point they've agreed to it. The retail example is actually something that IBM would not do today. Um, it is something that actually violates lots of privacy laws around the world. Mm. Um, so, so, it's, but it's it was all, a good idea at the time. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's a great, you know, thought, thought, you know, experiment. And, and it's, it's, you know, if, if, you know, I'm not going to tell a company not to do it, but, or, or I would, that we, we wouldn't do it. But I, I think, you know, it generates issues because I'm walking into a retail store and I am not given the opportunity to not have this not yet let them use my information. And then how have they gotten that information about this is my face and I'm this customer in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is not something that we would be comfortable implementing today, um, you know, using facial recognition. In fact, we said facial recognition shouldn't be used for things like that, where, you know, we made a statement a couple of years ago that, that said that, and we fully believe it, we stand by it. So, but I think, you know, the intent is very good. And let's talk about the intent of both of these. And it's to kind of do what we talked about at the beginning, which is how do we put the human first? How do we understand the problems that the humans, our customers, our employees, our contractors, the humans that run and interact with our business, essentially, what is the value we create for them? So as a customer, I walk into a retail store or I call in someplace and, you know, we talked about this a minute ago. I don't want to have to give them the whole backstory. I just want the answer to my questions. And so, you know, AI that understands me as a human being, as long as I've opted into it, it can understand me as an individual. That's fantastic. And that solves a lot of problems. So a story I've been using for a number of years is you show up at a theme park and you walk through the gate and, you know, it, you bought your ticket online and you use your ticket. So it, you know, essentially a theme park knows who you are. And then you're walking around the theme park with your family and it says, hey, your favorite ride's available. You want to go there with a short line. I, I'd, I'd say, you know, well, what's going on? Why are you doing this? How did you know who I am and where I am and what my favorite rides are? Um, and, and I didn't ask for this. However, you know, when I sign up and buy my ticket, they say, hey, we want to make your experience at the park much better, minimize the amount of time you're waiting in. Would you mind if we gave you notifications while you're at the park telling you that you could get to your ride faster? Right. That that's something that I'm interested in. Hey, you know, the other park is has no lines in it. Why don't you go over there and you're right, you know, sue your favorite rides are over there. That's a great experience because I asked for it. It's not creepy. The first one is creepy. The same thing can happen in, in businesses and, and and it's important or other businesses, it's important to keep that in mind. Right. I, there is a creep vector. But once again, I'm the guy that says, put the chip in my neck. So I would opt in well, for facial recognition. I would opt in and, for you to create a better experience for me. And, and, and that's great. You should have the opportunity to opt in if you want to, but you need to have that opportunity to opt in. It shouldn't just be a default. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we, we can talk for hours on this, I'm sure. Before I ask you my final question, I want to hear from you what trends uh, we're seeing in advances in AI that we can look forward to uh, enjoying the experience with. Yeah, so so I think there's there's a few trends. So one is a trend that you may have heard of, you know, consumer facing things around what, what's called Dolly, right? Uh, Dolly two, which is this, you know, there's a cute tool that you can do that generates images from text. So so that trend um, is based off of a set of technologies called foundational models, which are basically trained on massive they're AI trained on massive amounts of data. Uh, you know, in some cases, the whole of the internet that allow you to use a small amount of data to answer specific questions to a business. And so this is a technology focused on language, focused on vision. We're focusing on other things like understanding time series. So what are things that happen in, in, over a course of time? Um, you know, anomaly detection. So fraud, part defect, things like that. So foundational models are one. The other is, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, iRobot, which is the Will Smith movie you were 
who you were talking about, which by the way is a great book also by Isaac Asimov, if you're a sci-fi nerd. Um, you know, apparently one of the, you are. <laughs> <laughs> one one of the uh, one of the the gaps in getting there, and there's many that we know and some that we don't know, is an AI's ability to reason. So as humans, we can reason. AI today cannot. Uh, and the ability to have reason applied to a traditional AI model is through something called symbolic learning or neurosymbolic learning. And that field has been around for a while. And so as the field of you know, machine learning is what we call most of what we talk about is AI, the merging of those two is what's having today, happening today where you can teach a, a machine learning or deep learning model to reason using neurosymbolic learning and this is where the new kind of, uh, this will be over the course of the next two to three years where we'll see AI be able to inter interact and with us and be able to reason in a more uh, human-like manner, but not nowhere near what we're talking about with say iRobot. So here's, so I just wanna, I've got to ask you about the human-like matter. I think it's easy when it's text going back and forth, but am I, how soon is it before I think I'm talking to a human and not a robot? Um, you know, so, so I think to a certain extent, you could get a little bit of that today, especially with these foundational models behind some of these conversational, these voice capabilities, because there's so much information that they've been trained on that they could convince you that they were human. I think it's important. I think it's important, though, that companies that leverage AI for conversations let humans know that they're interacting with an AI. Though, oh yeah, um, I think that's important. But I, th I think today, to a certain extent, you could get a, 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 a feeling like it's reasoning and you're talking to a human, but it's not actually at that level yet. It's just been trained on so much data that it seems like it is because it's got so much context around the world from 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 the vast amount of data around the world. Well, I look forward to the day when it, it really does feel like I'm talking to a person and not the machine. Uh, hey, last question. I always end every interview with this question. The one thing question. Is there one last insight, piece of information that you would like to share with us about anything related to AI? So, so I, think, I think, you know, kind of where we started the conversation, right? This human focus, value focused approach to AI for companies is really important, especially in the space of, you know, the focus of what your podcast is usually on, you know, customer care, things like that. We need to understand the human. Uh, so we need to un also understand the language uh, of business and understand the languages that humans speak, uh, be able to use that information to automate workflows and process processes. And do this in a trustworthy manner. So ensure that AI is fair. Uh, ensure that it's free of specific biases. It's transparent. It's explainable. And it preserves the privacy of the individuals. Uh, and this is what we mean when we talk about AI for business. It understands the language of your business. It automates workflows and processes. And it's trustworthy and compliant with regulation. So I think it's important that your, your, your listeners understand that when they're interacting with AI and build implementing AI in their organizations, that these are part of it. Great, excellent, excellent insights. We've been talking with Dr. Seth uh, Do Dobrin. I'm gonna try, I, I have a friend of mine whose last name is Dorbin. So I'm looking at your name thinking either I'm dyslexic, nothing wrong with that, but is this the correct spelling? <laughs> anyway, Seth Dobrin, IBM's Global Chief AI Officer with insights into uh, actually the future, which is happening right now as we speak. Thanks for being on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. All right, everybody, that wraps it up. Another episode of Amazing Business Radio. We will be back next week with another great interview. I hope you come back. Until that time, this is Shep Hyken reminding you to always be amazing. <laughs>